and we're going to start talking about tools for building models. If you have questions, ask them in the voice chat channel, just above where we are. All right. So as you can see on my um, my workbench here, I've got a bunch of different tools out. Um, I don't use all of these every time I build a model, but I just kind of wanted to cover um, what all of them are. So the first thing is nippers, right? We've got a bunch of different kinds of nippers. These are your more heavy duty side cutters that you can find at any hardware store. I generally don't recommend actually using these uh, on models. Um, they're very heavy duty, they don't cut very cleanly. These are what you want to use for cutting stuff like paper clips, wires, bigger resin chunks, um, things that are tougher and are going to be um, do more damage to the thing you're cutting them with. Um, this is kind of a middle pair. These are some really cheap ones that you can also generally find at any hardware store. Um, used to be able to get in electronic stores, those, those don't really exist anymore. Uh, these are generally what I use for my preliminary cuts off of the runner. Um, just because it's a bit more plastic to cut through, it doesn't have to be very precise. Sometimes I'll clip thinner gauge wire with these because I don't care if they get damaged because they're like $4 a pop. Um, the actual finer cutters, I have two different pairs here that I like to use. These are the less thin ones from Tamiya. Um, these are probably about 18 bucks. They're really nice. Um, they're an upgrade definitely over these, just in terms of how cleanly they cut. They have a much finer blade. Um, but these are even better. These are the one, two, threes from Tamiya. Um, they cut very cleanly. They're not quite as good as, say, God Hands or something more expensive like that, but they do still make a very nice flush cut. Um, one of the other big tools that you'll see a lot is the pin vise. You know, it's basically just a small hand drill. You've got a chuck that you can tighten or loosen with this collar. There's different size chucks that come with it for different size drill bits. This is great for pinning, for making barrel holes, for making small detailed holes in general. The nice thing is since it's hand powered, you're never going to spin it fast enough to melt the plastic. You have a lot more control over it than using like a rotary tool or a drill would give you. Generally, they come with an assortment of bits. You can use any drill bit that'll fit inside the chuck, though. You know, you can go down to the hardware store and just buy whatever you need. If you look, there's the, mine at least came with four different chuck sizes. There's two on each of these shafts. So you just got to play around and make sure that the bit fits well. Some stuff is just going to be too big. I doubt anything's going to be too small. Um, the number one tool for me is this hobby knife, exacto knife, whatever you like to call it. Um, blades are cheap, the handle's cheap, it's, it's pretty easy to get set up with one of these. Uh, I generally like to have two of these around. Usually I keep a very fresh blade in one of them, and then an older dull blade in a second one. Um, that way I can always keep my fresh blade for the cuts that really matter and, and use the dull blade for more beater work like scraping mold lines or cutting things that I don't need very precise, um, prying things open sometimes, which isn't really a good idea. Uh, this is a hobby saw or a razor saw. I have this cheaper Exacto one. It's not very fantastic, but it gets the job done. Uh, it's got this nice reinforced back to help you cut a straight line. They also make little miter boxes for these that you can put a piece in and then cut through um, certain tracks to get exact angles, which can be really nice if you're trying to do precise cuts. Um, the one thing with this thing is you don't you don't want to push down a lot. You just want to pull it back and forth and let the blade itself do the work. Uh, when you start pushing down, you can warp the blade really easily or get it bound up. You won't get nice straight cuts. So with these, it's always better to just take your time and let the actual blade edge do the bulk of the work rather than trying to force it through whatever you're cutting. This works well on plastic, resin, obviously softer metals it'll work for, but that's going to eat your blade up really quick. Uh, the blades themselves are cheap, so if you feel it start to not really do much, get rid of it. Get a new one. Otherwise, you're just going to tear up whatever you're working on. Um, these are always kind of a nice thing to have. These are sanding sticks. You can get them in all kinds of different grits. 
you know, it's basically just sandpaper bound to, you know, a kind of squishy foam core. They're somewhat flexible. You can get them in all kinds of shapes and sizes. I've gotten ones that are nice that kind of come to more of a point to get into finer areas. Um, these are the squadron ones. I wouldn't recommend getting them because they don't last very long. They lose their grit very fast. Um, but they're very helpful, especially with resin for polishing up rougher areas after you've done your, your first sort of trim on things. Um, obviously, you always... What's it? They're essentially just uh, like nail sanding sticks. Yeah, they're very similar can, to emery boards. Yeah, you can buy emery boards at like makeup supply stores and stuff like that, and they do the same thing. Yep, and they do make even emery boards in sort of this like ultra fine grits for really getting a high polish on things, which can be nice. Um, also, man, just to note, you might want to disable your leave and join sounds on the voice chat. Oh, I don't have them on. I never, never do. Um, this is another removal tool. These are um, diamond files or needle files. Um, this is a really cheap set. I would not recommend getting a really cheap set. Uh, what you find with the ultra cheap sets is that a lot of the times the the etching for the, the the tooth of the blades is really poor, or you get jaggy ends, and they can actually end up doing more damage than they help. Um, I also generally don't use these too often on plastic. Um, I find that they serve me better on metal and resin, whereas with the the AB, you know, the uh, the polystyrene plastic that you know Games Workshop models are and stuff, I don't usually find I need something this abrasive on them. Usually, just uh, the hobby knife and some sandpaper is more than enough. Um, but they can be nice, and they come in a variety of shapes. You know, you can get sort of triangular ones, rounder ones, flat ones, um, which can help you get into a variety of places and deal with a bunch of different surface, you know, shapes, like different, you know. I do wish there was a nice rounded one for going over convex stuff, but I don't have one. That's where the flexible stuff comes in handy. And also, too, just scraps of sandpaper can be really nice. I don't have any in front of me, but, you know, you can fold it up to get into corners. You can use it on just on your tabletop to sand something flat. I find that having a few different grits starting at, I don't know, maybe, what would you say, right, like 400 grit and going up? Yeah, 400 and up, let's go. Yeah, will give you a nice spread. Um, sheets of sandpaper are dirt cheap. You can get one for like 30 cents a pop at, you know, your hardware store or whatever. Just go pick out, you know, four or five different grits. They're good to have around. They're super handy. Um, so I guess uh, the next... Excel has a question. Sure. I usually use some sandpaper to file my minis while assembling, and once saw that the Army Painter files advertise themselves as better slash more appropriate to miniatures since they have a better grit density, I believe. Do you think I could get the same experience with regular files, i.e. not branded products? Yes, absolutely. There's, there's almost nothing that exists in the hobby world that's branded as being a hobby product that didn't already exist outside of hobbying beforehand. You know, in this case, sandpaper has been around for a lot longer than hobbying has. Um, yeah. The grit is just add, the grit. Yeah. That's... I'd also add that uh, there are diamond files as well as bastard files. Mm -hmm. The bastard files are the ones with cuts in the blade. And essentially, it, it, they all remove a lot of material and they're very rough. Diamond files are more fine. And you can buy diamond files for very fairly cheap on Amazon or whatever. And they're better than... Uh, bastard type files. Yeah, that's the uh, bastard's got more of that like C shape cut out of it. Yeah. Remove a lot more material at once. Whereas these are just literally an etched diamond shape, so it's not. It's still a bit coarse. You know, you can really feel it, but it does remove less material and it gives you a smoother result. Kind of yeah. the difference of using a, a much rougher sandpaper, which has got a higher grit, versus the more finished sandpaper. Um, so. For actually assembling the model, obviously we're going to want to have some sort of adhesive. Uh, the two big ones that we mostly deal with are CA glue or super glue, cyanoacrylate. Um, I'm sure most people are kind of familiar with this stuff. You can get it in, you know, a variety of containers, shapes and forms, different viscosities. I tend to like a medium viscosity myself because it gives me a little bit more work time, but it doesn't take quite as long as a gel does to dry. 
Whereas this stuff, the cheaper, lower viscosity tends to dry out faster. You know, cyanoacrylate works by um, absorbing moisture and setting. So I think the thinner stuff just lets the moisture in faster. You can also get this great product called Zip Kicker, which is an accelerant for the super glue that, you know, you'll put super glue on one piece, put the zip kicker on the other, and then when you put them together, it bonds instantly, which can help with some of those peskier pieces that you don't necessarily want to hold. Um, this generally I only recommend for metal and resin models. I don't like building plastic models with super glue. I don't think it works as well. Some people like it, but, you know, teach their own. We don't, we don't. We don't need to encourage those people. Yeah, I don't. I, I, I discourage <laughs> that. Um, so if, when you are building stuff out of polystyrene, what I would use is plastic glue. Um, this is the one I use generally the most. This to me, extra thin. This stuff is great because it has really, really low um, surface tension, so it flows really well. Um, generally, you use this via capillary action. So you'll hold two pieces together use this fantastic little brush and dab it along where the pieces touch. The capillary action is going to wick this in between the two plastic pieces, allowing you to get a really nice um, tight fit on it. This stuff, uh, although it's called cement and glue, is just solvent. So what it's going to be doing is melting the plastic so that when you know the two pieces eventually cure out, they're, they're welded into one piece now, which I think makes Hiding seam lines, getting a smoother overall finish a lot easier than if you're going to try to use super glue where you're just adding a bonder between two things. Um, I, I generally recommend the Tamiya because it does have that nice brush applicator. Um, this kind of a thing is okay too, where it will come with a needle type tip. I will say if you're using this, I find it to be a lot easier to put some of this on a piece of tinfoil and then use toothpick that I usually sharpen for application. Do you think we could use the glue that kind of melts the plastic together? Yep, that's what we're talking about here. That's what these are. This is plastic cement. So this is what's actually going to melt the plastic. And you can see a good example of that is, this is another product. This is called sprue glue. It's something you make yourself. This is just an old bottle of Tamiya Extra Thin that I've fed a bunch of shavings of plastic into. So you can see it's made this sort of milky glue. Uh, what this has now is a bunch of plastic actually melted into it. So when you paint it over, you know, a seam line, it's going to do some filling as well as, as gluing it together. And then you can sand it really nicely after that. Um, if you've got a bottle that's getting towards the end, I recommend making it into this. It's a handy substance to have around. It can save you some time with gap filling. A um, lot of companies make uh, plastic cement. Virtually any company that produces plastic models and also hobby products has a, a plastic cement product as well. Yep. Um, to me, uh, ultra thin or extra thin is one of the ones that most people recommend the most because it's basically the only one that you can really make sprue glue with. Mm -hmm. And it's one of the only ones out there that actually like look into the recesses like it does. Yep. It's definitely, I would say, the easiest to use above any other. Yeah, I would also personally recommend staying away from the plastic glue that comes in tubes and is like a thicker compound that's more like a glue type compound. I find it to be a total nightmare to work with versus something nice and thin that you can apply with the brush that comes with it or a toothpick. Always use, always use this stuff with ventilation because yep. it's not good for you. Yep, that's the other thing. These are full of ketones and um, acetone, so open your windows if you can. If you're going to be gluing a ton of models and you have a respirator, it doesn't, um, it's not going to hurt to help, you know, protect your lungs. You only get one pair of them. So keep chemicals out of them as much as you can. Does the material of the files matter? I have some bronze files that appear to be typically used for pewter. They're also oiled. Could this oil be an issue? Um, the oil would get on the metal miniature and then you'd have to clean it off yeah, before you paint. Yeah, you'd have to use soap and water to make sure that you really got that oil off because otherwise no paint's going to stick to it. Um, the material of the files does matter to some degree. You know, obviously with all the things that we're working with here, bronze is going to be harder than it. Um, 
but if it was made out of some softer metal, you may have a hard time with pewter. But I don't, I don't, you know, files generally aren't made out of softer stuff, so uh, it shouldn't really matter. The bronze is probably going to dull faster, is one thing, you know, than steel because it's just not, not quite as hard. Yeah, um, I'm not really familiar with bronze files. Yeah. Uh, in terms of gap filling, because right, that's an important part of this process. A lot of the time when we put a model together, no matter how good the design on the fit is, sometimes you're going to see some gaps where there seams. Um, one of the things I like to use is this um, Vejo plastic putty. Uh, this stuff's great because it's water-based, so you can, you know, it thins and smooths with water. So you can really kind of play around with it. It's easy to clean up if you've gotten too much in the model. You can just take a damp brush and, and mop it up. Um, it dries nice and hard, it sands pretty well, and it tends to stick in the gap, but it tends to only really work for smaller gaps. You can't really build up a large bridging of gaps with this stuff because it does shrink a bit. Um, There's a similar product called Perfect Plastic Putty that's almost the exact same thing. Either one is pretty good. <laughs> you know, and they're, it's cheap too, which is nice. It's a... Um, it's quite affordable. The other stuff you'll see people use a lot is an epoxy putty. This is one of the more common ones. This is uh, Nidatite, also known as green stuff. Um, it's a two-part polymer clay. So when you mix these two pieces together, you'll get, end up with green uh, bubble gum, basically, that you can use to push in and fix the gaps of your model. This also smooths decently well with water. Um, if you're using something like this, I highly recommend getting yourself at least one of these tools. This is a silicone shaper. So you can see it's it's got like a bullet shaped uh, head on it that's made out of silicone, which is great because silicone does not stick very well to the epoxy putty. So you're able to maneuver and shape it in there. Any of the tools that you're using when you, when you use this stuff, you're going to want to have wet. Um, so that it doesn't stick. Yeah. It depends on which epoxy putty you're using. Yep. Water works a little bit for all of them. Yeah. For green stuff specifically, the easiest way to lubricate your tools for it is Vaseline. Yep. Uh, uh, if you do use Vaseline, you have to wash the model afterwards once it's cured. Yeah, same thing as, as sort of with those oiled files. You know, if you're introducing any sort of oil to the model during the construction process, even if you notice that your hands are really oily while you're building, you're going to want to wash that model. Your, your, your primer is never going to stick. Um, one um, of... Mystical Noodles asks, what is this putty for? You can use it for a lot of different things, um, sculpting, uh, added detail, things like that. But... The basic application for it is just gap filling larger gaps that can't be filled using other means. Yep. This is my, my personal favorite for gap filling is this Magic Sculpt. Um, similarly to green stuff, you mix the two parts together, you know, uh, out of these tubs. You've got about an hour before the stuff really starts to set up. Um, this one I like because it smooths really well with alcohol. Uh, you can get it super smooth with, with a brush with a little bit of alcohol in it. And this also cures up a lot harder than green stuff does. Green stuff, when it's fully cured, is still a little bit pliable. It's a little bit tacky. You can see this is um, not tacky, but a little pliable. This is a green stuff little um, tentacle type thing that I made. And you can see it's got quite a bit of bend to it. So this can be nice for more organic materials like a cloth or some skin or something like that. Um, but it's it's I find myself at least it's hard to get um, hard edge detail out of this material. Uh, it doesn't hold it's it good. as well. Yeah, it's good for thinner things, things you need to be more durable mm -hmm. as well, because it has that give it will allow it to give a little before it breaks. Right. Whereas this, once it's hardened, um, is is more. It's it's harder, but it's also more brittle, especially in th with thinner pieces. Instead of giving, it'll just snap off. Um, but it is really good stuff, and this is also great if you're trying to actually sculpt certain things, you know, instead of just gap filling, but trying to add details. This can be really nice to work with. Um, I like it a lot, and it's quite affordable too. A pound of this, I think, is only like eighteen dollars, and it'll last you a long time. Um, and Magic Sculpt is also like completely water soluble, so mm -hmm. you can actually use it with water and mix water with it to make like a slurry, which you can then use to gap fill as well. Yep. 
the other big one even surface imperfections and stuff like that yeah it's great for, for you know if you have uh, orange peel texture on a model or something you can get in there and uh, fill it in and then sand it out yeah. the other one you'll see really commonly is milliput i like that one as well the your classic yellow is good the white's also good that's got a finer grain to it uh, so it sands down a little smoother in the end but that's basically any and all of the tools that I generally use if I'm building a model. Sometimes I will use a rotary tool if I'm working on bigger resin models, but I don't think that we really need to cover that because not everyone has a rotary tool or wants to buy one. Um, all of these things here are, are quite affordable, you know, and really you could get away with, I would recommend two pairs of clippers, a rougher cut one and a finer cut one, a hobby knife, a pin vise, and just this, you could you could get away with building most anything. Um, other stuff is nice, you know, but it's not n super necessary all the time. What about tools to cut pieces that normally join to make a door to a panel that opens, for example? Um, join to make a door to a panel. That, are you talking about just like? doing fine cuts through the shape of an existing piece of plastic surcut um uh, honestly you know you you can get in there with with an exacto blade and i think one thing that people don't realize with an exacto blade is you don't have to make one final lots of pressure cut and be done with it you can set a guide up and make lots of successive cuts in the same area and slowly work your way through the plastic with with a blade um you don't want to be putting a lot of pressure when you're using an exacto knife that's generally how you hurt yourself uh, if you're finding that you need to put a lot of pressure into something throw that blade out put a new one in. you want a fresh blade um, they're cheap i can't I can't impress how important it is to have the sharpest blade you can in this thing for your main cutting one. Dull knives are how you hurt yourself. Um, I say this with a lot of experience as a chef. You, you always want your knife as sharp as possible with the least resistance. You're going to make a lot less mistakes, and you're probably not going to jab it in your finger that way. Um, with some stuff like that, though, with, you know, cutting maybe where it, uh, the shape of a door so that it opens now, you may be better off scratch building a two, two pieces of a door instead. You know, sometimes cutting... Styrene tends to deform it, you know, if you, you know, for example, if I cut through the edge of the sprue, you can see that there's, there's deformation that happens. It's not a super clean cut with that kind of a thing. So it, it, it may be better to start from the beginning. Um, to that end, we're going to look at building this, this Necron, uh, I forget what model it is, Necron Overlord or something real quick. This is one of the push to fit models from the new Indominus box. I'm going to be removing the push to fit pegs, I believe, because I don't like the way they function. I generally recommend if you get one of these Warhammer easy to build boxes, you take a look at how the model goes together and then you clip all those pegs off because they don't often allow for a good fit. Or at least clip them shorter. Yeah, shorter. Yeah. They usually have a little flash or something on the end and it prevents you from closing it all together. Right. Um, so one of the first things that I see people do is they go to the runner and they go right up to where the runner hits the model and they clip right there. Don't do that. You're putting a lot of extra pressure right at that point. That's going to often result in pitting or deformation of that piece. So what you want to do is go away from where it actually connects to the model and clip it so that you still have a little bit of the runner attached to the piece that you're cutting out. Um, if you look at the way flush cutters work, right, this is the this is the cutting edge right here is where it joins the back of the blade. That's where it's flush. So that's a flat, um, and then it angles out this way. So when you are actually removing it later, you're going to want to put that flat piece, the flat side of it, against the the model piece that you're you're going to be removing it from, to minimize the amount of pitting and to get that nice smooth cut. You'll end up with less cleanup. So once we have this piece out, you know, I've used my rougher cutters. I'm going to go back in with my nicer ones and just line it up so that the blade is flush against the model itself, 
and you can see it left a little bit of a, a white mark just because that's what styrene looks like when you cut it but if I run my thumb over this it hasn't created a pit so I'm not going to need to fill anything there I'm only going to need to scrape it a little bit um, I was someone who was very skeptical in the beginning of buying anything other than these four dollar cheapy cutters um, however I'm also a firm believer in investing in tools you get good tools, they last you a lot longer, they perform a lot better. Something like these, they may be $30, but the results are extremely measurable. Um, I spend way less time cleaning up my models after I've trimmed them out than I used to. And for me, that's, you know, time is money. You get better results. These can also be sharpened again. Uh, you could, If you have a local tool shop, they may be able to do that for you and take them down. I've done that with my older pair where I've gone to someone who does knife sharpening and they've been able to grind these to a nice fresh edge for you. So, you know, $30 could last you quite a while. Um, in general, I, I, I really advocate for spending the money on, on tools because they, they can be with you for a very long time. So once we've gotten all of our little pieces of runner removed from the model the next thing that you're going to want to look for is the mold line right and for me i always kind of think about how this came off of the runner your mold line is going to happen basically in the in the middle of the runner right where the two sides of the mold have come together there's always going to be a little bit of a line where they met i heard that you should cut away from the model see to put strain on it and then sand away the bit sticking out yeah, um, I mean, this basically only applies to um, using clippers as opposed to flush cutters. Yep. So like he was talking about, some flush cutters have a blade instead of pinchers, basically. Mm -hmm. And ones that actually cut rather than pinch will cut clean enough that you can cut close to the model and not risk pitting the model. So God Hands, Tamiya Sharp Side Cutters, Gundam Planet Sharp Side Cutters... Um, there are a lot of options out there, and all of them uh, are able to cut right next to the model. That's one of the advantages of using those over regular flush cutters. Right. I would only be sanding the nibs down, generally, if it was a gate that I had removed on a resin model, because I find that cutting close to it on resin has a higher chance of causing pitting, and I'd rather be safe and just sand it away. Resin I also find easier to just batch sand. Um, it's easier to smooth. Um, the Army Painter ones are, are they're okay. They don't have as thin of a blade as you see here, and that's what's really going to be the the deciding factor is how thin your your blade is and the style, like Red was saying, of how it does it. Like these pinch too. These aren't quite like the God Hands. They're they're coming together in a, in a pinching motion with the blades, whereas the God Hands are more of like a I don't know, like a gate closing or something where they. One side on God hands, other. yeah. On God hands, one half of the pinchers is flat. There's no sharpness to it. It's mm -hmm. it's just dull. And the other half is literally a thin blade, and it's sharp. So when you cut apart, the dull side will basically push against the other side, while the sharp side will cut through to the dull side. Yeah, it's like this so you get a, a cut rather than a pinch. Right, and you get way less pitting in the end, way less stress marks and everything. It cuts very clean. Yeah. Um. So once you've, once you've gotten the nubs off, the, the next step right is to get rid of the mold lines. And basically, once you go and you see where one mold line is, you can just kind of imagine that it's going to run around the entire model on that line. So I like to just pick a place and start and then work entirely around, double check it, put that piece down, move on to the next one. Um, the way you assemble stuff is up to you. I just find it's a good way to just clean a piece entirely as soon as I've cut it out and put it to the side so I know everything that is off of the runner is going to be ready to be glued. Um, Do you have any Tamiya sanding sponge? No. Okay. Well, another good option for sanding materials is Tamiya sanding sponge. Yeah. Uh, it's essentially just little squares of sanding sponge. They're thick uh, sanding grit uh, attached to sponge, basically just like a tight foam sponge. And they're really good for cleaning mold lines off of rounded objects and things because uh, because of the fact that it's sponge, it'll conform to the surface more, so you don't, like, flatten the surface when you're sanding it. Right. That's an issue with these, you know. 
say if I'm on this nice rounded handle of this weapon, if I take this and I just start working this and I don't kind of rotate it back and forth like this, I'm going to get flat spots and it's going to look bad. <clears throat> yep. um, so one thing I see people do a lot, right, they've got the mold line, they try to slice it. Don't do that. Don't pull the blade of the knife towards you. Uh, if you're just trying to eradicate mold lines, you want to angle the blade away from you so that the top of the blade's facing towards you a bit, at like a good angle, and just scrape lightly. You, you really don't have to um, get in there and scrub away with your knife. Just have some nice light pulls towards you. Um, just the way that edge is going to be oriented is going to be enough to eradicate mold lines on everything except, you know, the oldest, shittiest models out there that have been in, you know, the same mold forever. When I do this, I keep just like a brush around. Um, I just find it's easy to just, instead of blowing constantly into my microphone, uh, I'll just use this to brush away the stuff that I've scraped up. And, you know, same thing for at the cutting point. You just want to pay attention to what the surface of that area looks like. And gently and gently, slowly use your blade to scrape it away. You don't have to try to get it all immediately. It's okay if it takes you 20, 30 passes of scraping to get it down to be nice and smooth. Um, obviously, if something's sticking up a lot more, that's a good time to go in with a little bit of a sanding implement. Again, if you're doing a, a curved surface, you kind of want to move it in a way that's, that's following that curved surface so you're not flattening it out. And my big check too is just take your thumbnail and like close your eyes and run it over it. See if you can feel it catch on anything or if it feels nice and smooth. Um, plastic can be weird with the way it looks and sometimes it'll look really smooth like you've gotten everything, but then you'll go to prime it and you'll you'll actually see, you know, qu quite a mold line there, um, which is frustrating because then you've got to sand it and prime it again. I'm, but to that end, you know, I'm sure Red will cover this more in the painting portion. That's a major function of priming, you know, is to check and make sure that you've got everything nice and smooth. You know, that's that's what's going to show it to you. So if you do have to adjust something and prime again, it's it's not the end of the world. It's super normal. Sometimes I'll prime a model like two or three times just because I'm like, oh, OK, I saw another thing here. I got to fix that before I actually start getting paint on it. Um, and do yourself the favor and take the time to do it, because we'll all notice if you don't. We'll shame you for it. So, like I was saying, I just go around knowing where that mold line is going to be and just tracing it along the whole model, just gently scraping away. Um, sometimes you'll get, you know, annoying stuff where it's on these like raised tubing stuff, and that's where you really want to go light with the scraping. Um, it's really easy to go overboard and all of a sudden you're destroying detail and you don't have this nice cabled tubing type stuff anymore. Uh, whereas if you if you keep a soft hand with it, you you won't. You know, you'll you'll preserve the detail and still get rid of that little mold line. Obviously the newer the mold, the less mold lines you have to deal with. They they increase over time as an injection mold is used as it gets older and older. So if you get nice fresh stuff like this Indominus box, there's not a whole heck of a lot of cleanup to do for it. Uh, Chalco asks, Citadel has a mold line removal tool. Is it effective for this purpose? It is, but it's... So the mold line it's... removal tool is basically just the back of a hobby knife yeah. with a different shape. Um, it's not and anything you special. Literally... <laughs> you can use the back of, a, of your hobby knife instead of the cutting blade, mm -hmm. and that won't dull your edge. You can also buy hobby knife uh, blades that are the same shape as the mold line removal tool, and I would recommend that over buying the mold line removal tool. Yeah. Yep. Yep. In general, that's just another, it kind of harkens back to one of the first things we said, like, there's a lot of stuff out there that's branded by these hobby companies, right? And, on, on like, obviously they're going to try to make some money, they're a business, but... I've personally found it to just be a better investment of time and for myself, like paying who I'd rather put money in the pocket of to go and find most of the stuff you can find in alternative sources. You know, 
hardware stores have so many tools that we can use. Art supply shops have so many tools we can use. Um, there's no reason to pay a premium markup to Games Workshop or Army Painter because they're literally taking something that already exists and just putting their name on it. And there's no and real because bonus. They're a hobby... Yeah, because they're a hobby company, sometimes like with Army Painter, they will be trying to source cheaper products that they can rebrand and sell under their own brand. Whereas companies that are dedicated to making these tools will sell better products because they're manufacturing them themselves. Right. <clears throat> you know, you get stuff like um, Red's Red uses Nipex yeah. cutters like these. What are the, those are a lifetime warranty, right? Yeah, they have a warranty. So I chipped the blade on mine, and I was able to send uh, an email to the company, and they literally just sent me a new pair. Yeah. Um, you're not usually going to get things like that from Army Painter and Citadel. Nope. Um, and companies like Nipex and Godhand, Tamiya, these companies are usually manufacturing their own tools. So, you know, they're usually making good products. Right. Whereas Army Painter and Citadel are basically like, well, Citadel is a little different because there's a more special design, but Army Painter is literally yeah. just buying something like this and putting it in their box and selling it to you there yeah. it's you know cheap stuff from from china or taiwan or somewhere so it's generally i don't find it to be worth the the investment for what you're getting um to me is one of the few hobby brands out there that i think all of their products are appropriately priced and perform very well um they've also been around for a very long time and a lot of the stuff, honestly, aimed more at the scale modeling community seems to be a little more um, fairly priced. Whereas, you know, Citadel, what their nippers are, what, $35, and they're not even anything special. They're, you know, they're almost as much as God Hands and not nearly as good. Yeah. Same with their pin vice. You know, you can get this pin vice for $8 on Amazon. Yeah, there's a lot of uh, Japanese companies as well that produce just exclusively hobby tools, uh, like Mr. Hobby, Tamiya. Uh, Tamiya doesn't produce exclusively tools, but they produce tools. Mm -hmm. um, there's a bunch of others, and they usually produce very good quality tools, and they're usually reasonably priced and affordable. Uh, yeah. There are exceptions, but... Yeah. Stuff your, your, like that is generally very good. Your 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 mileage may vary for sure. Um, but he would still, you know, like buying an Exacto blade versus buying an Army Painter hobby knife. You know, uh, what what what's the real benefit or difference? There's kind of what I always examine. You know, it's it's a a handle with a chuck that holds a blade. There's there's not any technology that's going to be any different between this and Army Painters. You know, you're literally just paying for the brand at that point. Um, chances are you're going to buy Exacto blades to put in the thing anyway. So, you know, I don't really see the the point for a lot of that stuff. You know, with some exceptions. You know, like God Hands, they're worth every penny from from what I've I've seen and read about them because they are just the top of the line tool for the job. So some stuff, you know, yeah. is worth the the investment. You know. Yeah. Um. Wholesome Witch points out Ulfa is another company that makes cheap blades. They make handles as well, yep. hobby blade handles. Ulfa's They're great. They're really good. Uh, Anthony is talking about Swan Morton. I believe that's a scalpel blade handle. If that's the case, when you buy blades for them, make sure you get good quality blades because if you don't, then they can be very fragile with how they're designed. They're mm. not really made for hobbying. They're made for cutting, and that's it. Right. So if you're gonna buy scalpels, skin. Yeah. buy good scalpel blades. Yep. And I think too, uh, I was gonna try to maybe work on some um, a list of uh, recommended tools, and maybe like a uh, a rudimentary like stuff you need list. You know, stuff you should have. Yeah. I think would be a good resource <clears throat> for us. Um, I'm winging it and I'm building this without instructions because 
I bought this second hand, so we're getting there. Um, one thing I'll show though is, you know, this piece is going to end up here. Um, this is sort of how the Tamiya thin cement works, you know. I know that this is going to end up right there, so what I'll do is hold the pieces in place where the um, the edges are touching. You see I don't have a ton of glue on this, you don't need this like dripping with glue, and you just touch it to that spot. And that's going to wick right into that crack right there. Um, the nice thing with plastic glue is it's not super fast setting, you have a little bit of time to reposition stuff a bit and make sure you've got it right in the right spot. And then you'll, you will need to hold it there for a little while. Um, one thing to keep in mind is if you feel glue get on your fingertips, just put the model down. <laughs> Wash your hands. Um, if you have any, any bit of this plastic glue on your fingertips, it's a really easy way to end up accidentally imprinting your fingerprints on the model, smudging away detail, ruining a face. Um, so that's why I, you really want to, you know, with plastic glue, less is more. You don't need a shitload of it on there. Um, you really just want enough to get in between that seam and start melting those connection points. But um, flooding the model is going to, it's going to be a bad time in a hurry. And then it's going to be a lot e easier to mess it up. Um, disposable gloves, sure, but you're still going to get, you know, if you get glue on the glove, it's still going to make marks. Yeah. Uh, which is saying, God hands are super brittle. I strongly recommend them for things that will be painted. The finish is good, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, I would disagree, which uh, God hands are brittle and they are expensive. But if you use them the way that they say to use them on the back of the box, then you're not really going to risk damaging them very much. Um, I've stress tested mine and used them on thicker material than they say to use. I've cut clear parts like they say not to, etc. And I, I still haven't broken mine. As long as you cut with the inside of the jaws rather than the tip of the jaws like they say to do, then it, it shouldn't really be a problem. And cutting without getting stress marks even the god hands get stress marks when you cut it's it's unavoidable really uh and you're gonna have to sand no matter what uh it's just a matter of basically convenience ease of use uh god hands to me uh, sharp side cutters etc are just they just cut a little bit of the time and effort that you have to go through to get your models clean and ready for painting which it, it, it is important to have a clean model surface for painting yep. and getting rid of stress marks and stuff like that and the nibs and everything is, is important for that. Yeah, and to that to that end too, you know, um, sometimes the, the area you're in necessitates using the tip of your cutters, but you do generally want to be using the, the back part of your blade. Um, there's more material there, you're going to get a better cut through it. Uh, I, I see a lot of people that just snip, snip, snip with the tips, and you can wear the tips down really quick. Um, it's easy to snap them if you hit something that you didn't expect. So I would definitely recommend trying to use um, the meatier part of the blade. It's like with a you know a kitchen knife; you don't just cut with the very tip. You want to use the, the the middle portion of the blade as much as you can. Um, so now we've got all the things you screwed. This is a nice easy model. It's only got a few pieces. Um, Oh, one thing that I didn't mention too, that I actually have been using a lot more lately. Um, these are fantastic tools when you're assembling models. Just some regular old clothespins. Um, a lot of the time, you know, I I was I built this um, machine and career cow suit last night. A lot of these are like a two part that sandwiches together, similar to the chests on a Space Marine or something like that, where you've got two pieces that make a hole. Uh, and it's just really nice and easy to be able to clip this on there and put it to the side and know that you've got nice, even pressure across the seam and you don't have to worry about it. You don't have to sit there and hold it. Um, so if you've got some kicking around, I recommend playing around with them because I think that they can really, um, really be helpful in terms of freeing up some of your stuff, allowing you to work a little bit faster, get a little bit more done. Uh, you will see sometimes I do slice a little bit. Um, 
I don't recommend it unless you're very comfortable with that. It's very easy to gouge excess of the model away. So I would just, you know, recommend scraping. I personally feel super comfortable around knives, so I don't, I, I tend to do it a lot, but it is an easy way to screw it all up. True. True. There's nothing worse than eviscerating some nice detail that you were really looking forward to painting because you were in a hurry and you decided to slice instead of scrape. And you can even end up making more work for yourself if you gouge too deep. Now you're going to spend, you know, an extra couple of minutes trying to smooth that back out. Whereas if you're just scraping, it's pretty hard to fuck it up unless you accidentally run the tip across something and create a scrape that way. So again, don't use the very, very tip of your blade. Go to the middle of it when you're doing the scraping. Um, I do recommend, you know, when your main X-Acto knife isn't so sharp anymore, put a freshie in, use the duller one for scraping. You don't need it to be super sharp for eradicating mold lines. Um, and there's less of a chance of accidentally slicing into the model if it's a little bit duller, at least in my experience. Mm. Your mileage, as always, may vary. We got no directions. It doesn't matter. Um, the one thing I will say about these easy-to-build models is they do tend to have bigger gaps on them, um, which is a little annoying, but it's not the end of the world. Oh, fuck, does this one go together? That was the real question. Does anybody have any questions? Yeah, now is a good time while I'm just fiddling. Uh, if anyone's got anything they're wondering about, we love questions. Love knowing what you guys we are thinking. We love about. them. This is your opportunity to get information for yourself. Expand your. Don't ask is telling you you need to put the head and arm in before the chest plate. Yeah, I'm figuring that out. <laughs> Uh, Mystical Noodles asks, what was the suggestion again regarding the plastic glue? Well, Tamiya... Tamiya Extra Thin is the most common recommendation, I would say. It's at least what we would recommend most. Yeah, yeah Tamiya Extra Thin, and even just the regular Tamiya is nice too. Um, I don't use it anymore myself because my ran out and I just I have plenty of other glue at the moment, but um, those two come highly recommended. Uh, again, yeah. I wouldn't buy the Citadel plastic glue because you're going to pay more than you need to. There's plenty of other companies out there that make plastic glue for cheaper, and it's, you know, 99.9% .9 of the time it's the same stuff chemically. <laughs> you know, it'll do the same thing. You're not getting anything uh, extra from getting the Citadel version. Uh, Chauka asks, I know we aren't quite there yet, but it does come to mind, is it a bad habit to start painting models before they're fully assembled? Battletech has taken to producing pre-assembled plastic minis these days rather than the pewter of yesteryear. I find it extremely difficult to paint under the arms of these minis and especially the leg. <clears throat> Sub-assembly is essentially what you're talking about. and That's when you uh, assemble a model only in major parts so that you can access uh, areas that are restricted or obstructed by other parts of the model so you leave those parts that obstruct detail off so that you can paint the detail underneath and then paint the part itself that you'd left off and then assemble that's fine it offers its own challenges and, and issues but uh, it's a very common thing for people to do if you have any kind of part that's obstructing detail just leave it off Still clean it up, still prime it, but you'll have to attach it to a separate like piece of cork or a handle or something so that you can hold it and then uh, paint it separately. Uh, one of the issues with that is more complicated. It's more of an advanced thing. If you're doing lighting and detail like that on your model, or you have a very directionally specific lighting scheme on your model, um, it can be difficult to maintain uniformity when you're painting, when you have sub-assemblies. So you have to make sure you keep that in mind when you're painting. But otherwise, it's it's a good practice. Um, uh, 
one of the other things to note too is right like uh, on a model that you're considering subassembly on dry fit it all first and take a look at it um, if you're seeing very substantial gaps that are going to occur after gluing you're going to need to have those dealt with ahead of time you know one thing you can do is put them all together with um, blue tack and then fill the gaps with something that you can break away actually in um on painting buddha ben comets has a video where he's painting one of the age of sigmar corn warrior type guys um and he talks a lot about how he gap fills and then pops it off for sub assembly painting so that when he puts it all back together um, it's already gap filled and ready to go another big thing is the surfaces that are going to end up being glued at the end of the sub assembly you'll really want to mask when you're priming you want to have you know whether it be using super glue or plastic glue you want the gluing surfaces the faces of the surface that'll be glued to be raw plastic in the end you know if you don't have it for this this will eat through some of the paint but you won't get a good bond if it's with super glue the super glue is now bonding to the paint instead of the model itself so it's a much more weak or much weaker bond in the end so those are some other considerations with sub assembly too you know you can use um, poster tack to mask those glue points works really well or tape or whatever or you can scrape the glue points off after to expose the raw plastic again uh, but you're not going to have as fun of a time gluing stuff that isn't uh, isn't raw plastic. Yeah. So at this point, we pretty quickly put this model together. As like I said, it's it's a basic model. I think there's only like five pieces to it. Uh, and you know, you could see is any place that I put together and saw that there was the seam. I just took the plastic glue, dabbed it on the seam, and let capillary action whisk, wick that glue into the point. You give it a little little light squeeze after just to make sure it's got a good connection um, generally what I like to do and I, I check this a lot more often if it's a more complicated model with more pieces before I start gluing more things on I take a look at it every couple of pieces I put on and just make sure you know you didn't miss some little piece of you know flash or mold lines that maybe the next thing that you glue on there is going to make really hard to get in and scrape um, so always be checking your work while you're working on it. You know, I think it's something that everyone considers is that, you know, as you go, really take a look at what's happening and make sure that you're not um, screwing yourself, you know, for the future. Because uh, it's really easy to do that and then really regret that you didn't take that two minutes to go in there and say, oh, you know, I just I got to clean that little bit, bit up, especially if it's in deep on a model somewhere where now you've placed other things over it. Um, you know, Citadel models come with a base. These newer ones actually come with um, pilot holes on the base for you to put in. I generally like to attach the model to the base with super glue. Uh, the real reason for that is that plastic glue is not really reversible. Um, once it's together, it's together, unless you want to cut it apart. Uh, with super glue, however, you can use this cool trick where if you put the super glued model in the freezer, the water molecules that are inside of the super glue are going to expand and weaken the bond. Keep in mind it'll weaken any super glue bonds on the model, um, but it becomes very brittle after that and you can snap the super glue off a lot easier than uh, if it was not you know, put in the freezer for a bit. Um, so that's that's generally why I like to use it for basing because sometimes you know you you put the model on the base or you decide you want to change something with the base and it's an easy way to get it back off versus um, trying to take you know something like a hobby saw and cutting under the feet which is generally a destructive and messy process I'll be right back. but um, yeah so that's a basic look at you know introduction to building your models um, are there any questions that anyone else has before we start thinking about transitioning over to the painting side of things. Now is your time. Your time to shine. Yeah, I think that would be fun. Um, 
we could definitely do a conversion and kit bash kind of uh, workshop, you know. I think largely though with converting and kit bashing, it's less about process and more about your, you know, planning it out a bit, looking at what you have for materials, deciding if things work, creating, you know, storyboarding what you want to end up with basically or having an idea board looking at some inspiration um i mean converting and kit bashing is really fun because the sky's the limit you know there's there's no uh there's no end to how wild you can go as long as you want to get there you know if you want to spend the time if you want to m mess around if you want to try copying pieces with push molds or sculpting your own stuff um we can definitely do that and look at a lot of resources that I find very helpful. You know, like Ex Profundus is this really good website that has some amazing, like, Grimmer kit bashing. The Inquisitorium on, on Facebook is a great um, Facebook group that deals with the 28 community, which is super kit bashing heavy. You'll find a lot of very helpful folks there. Um, but it would be fun to do, you know, maybe like a workshop day where everyone comes in and we can talk about our ideas, post up pictures, work on, you know, idea boards together or something. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, 3D printing is, is new, right? People have been kit bashing since models came out. And honestly, I don't think that the 3D printing part of it to me feels a little, I don't know, less exciting because you're, you're, everything's right there for you. Whereas everyone before would have to look at what they have around them and how they can utilize it. Um, something that's really cool to check out is if you go on Instagram, check out the Dio, like deodorant speeder challenge. It's just a really fun project where everyone is making speeder bikes out of old deodorant containers. Um, just stuff like that, you know, looking at what materials you have around you can really, you know, try to in, in imagine what it could be on the model in the, in the greater context of things rather than just the shape that it is.